Welcome for the, to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman, a Senior Fellow and Executive Vice President here at CGD. Today, we'll be talking about deaths and data in low and middle income countries from COVID-19 and from all other causes. Accurate, complete, and timely data on mortality is probably the single most powerful policy tool we have today to mitigate the health and economic impact of COVID-19. But what is also clear is that we have not collectively built the systems necessary to record people's deaths in ways that enable their use to avoid more death and to protect livelihoods. This failure does not only dishonor individual sacrifices and experiences, but creates unnecessary suffering and prolongs this crisis and its effects. How is it possible to assess whether Sub-Saharan African countries are winning the fight against COVID if a large share of total deaths in a non-COVID year go unreported? Or how to judge the likely trajectory of Pakistan during COVID-19, we just held an event last week, if no mortality data of any kind is being reported in the public domain, according to the WHO's 2019 mortality report. Today, we'll be talking about one strategy, excess mortality measurement, to report on deaths in real time when routine systems cannot generate reliable cause of death classifications or where deaths in the community are left out of counts. We'll look at examples from countries that have started off with much better death registration, but that have still struggled to produce accurate and timely data. But we'll also be focusing on the big picture. What can we do to develop modern systems to accurately record and track deaths in closer to real time? What other innovative strategies are being tested? What would we like to see from the global community to support low and middle income country governments in this work? And how can we move this issue further up the agenda as it deserves? We're really lucky to be joined today by four world experts in this field. Uh, Philip Settle, who's the Vice President for Civil Registration and Vital Statistics at Vital Strategies. Fatima Marinho, who advises the Brazilian government on these issues from Vital Strategies. Samira Asma, the Assistant Director General for Data, Analytics, and Delivery for Impact at the World Health Organization, who has just launched her own or their own major data initiative and Aaron Nichols, who leads global civil registration and vital statistics improvement uh, at the US Centers for Disease Control. So let's get started. I'll turn it over to Philip first. Thanks so much, all of you. Thanks, Amanda. If you'll just give me one moment to share my screen and put us into slide mode here, presentation mode. Okay. Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon or even good evening. Uh, and thank you for joining us here. Um, this is an important topic and it really goes to the heart of the adage of know your epidemic, know your response, which is a phrase that was coined over a decade ago. But how do we know the COVID pandemic? We believe every country should know the scope and scale of the pandemic in real time to the greatest extent possible to shape a data-driven response. And here we have our WHO uh, global dashboard. Um, and it does represent deaths and confirmed cases due to COVID-19. But we need to be careful in terms of understanding and interpreting these numbers and understanding how robust the measures are particularly the measures of deaths and mortality, and particularly data that comes from uh, low and, and sometimes middle income countries. Uh, as Amanda indicated, this presentation is going to focus on one measure, that of excess mortality, that we feel captures the full scope and scale of the uh, toll of the pandemic. Now, uh, it should be no news that since early days in the pandemic, there have been shortages and concerns over testing, over its scope and its scale. Uh, since early days, uh, there have been worries over testing capacity throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, not to mention some high-income countries like the United States. But let's look at the implications of this testing context a little more closely when it comes to interpreting big numbers. One point I'd like to make is that testing, it has been argued, is actually an essential service in the context of the pandemic. Uh, as Kavanaugh et al. have argued in The Lancet uh, recently, in the absence of a vaccine or highly effective treatment, widespread testing is crucial to halting transmission and death. Uh, 
think this is uh, something with which we can all concur. And yet the reality on the ground, particularly in low and middle income countries is highly variable. And it's actually often, often inadequate in, and has been inadequate in relation to the need. Now, given the scarcity, testing has tended to be focused on symptomatic cases at health facilities or hospitals or to identify cases in clinical settings. The question here then is what are the implications for that scope and scale for the detection of the total burden of the pandemic? And as we have seen from, uh, can be seen from this clipping from theguardian.com, uh, this undercounts cases in the community, meaning that WHO uh, warned that it could be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the actual number of cases being detected. But what about deaths? You know, the, it, it, the, the, the key picture that I'm trying to paint for you today is, is what a murky picture we have because we do not have these counts and we do not have these data in hand uh, in many places. Um, uh, the WHO dashboard tallied over 960,000 confirmed COVID deaths as of this past Wednesday. But again, we need to unpack a little bit those numbers that are coming from countries that lack both robust and resilient vital statistics and civil registration programs uh, and cause of death data systems are usually rooted in the health sector that are not yet capable of delivering and providing timely data on cause of death. Now, in those kinds of contexts, there are two issues that arise in particular. The first can, pertains, of course, to getting the COVID-19 death numbers right themselves. If we're just trying to get COVID-19 deaths, how do we get it? Well, that's going to depend on the adaptation, not adaptation, but the adoption of uh, important uh, guidance issued by the World Health Organization in terms of how to correctly certify and code a COVID-19 uh, death, either suspected or confirmed. Now, this guidance, uh, which I've looked at, can get a little complicated when it concerns um, comorbidities, for example, uh, where there's COVID present and a comorbidity. The upshot is that all of this guidance needs to be disseminated, adopted, and manifest in the practices of coding physicians in order to have a very robust measure of COVID-specific and suspected mortality. The second issue, however, uh, that I want to call attention to deals with what's left out of the frame completely with an exclusive focus on COVID deaths and mortality. namely. There are deaths that occur in locations far away from hospitals where they cannot be certified. Amanda alluded to this reality, a stark reality, uh, in the, her opening remarks. Um, we leave out those deaths that arise from disruptions to overextended health systems. And we leave out deaths that occur because people avoid or delay seeking hospital care for fear of infection or if they fear they might be infected for fear of being separated from families and, 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 and uh, taken away. Um, it also often excludes emergency room deaths or those that we call brought in dead to hospital who are often not counted in hospital tallies and not assigned a cause of death. All of these forces are acting in many places where the majority of deaths, as Amanda pointed out, even before the pandemic were occurring at home. In many African contexts, for example, uh, this really contributes to a murky picture. We only have hypotheses at the moment uh, about the indications that we have that there may be comparatively fewer or unexpectedly low cases at the moment uh, of COVID-19 and COVID-19, well, or, or deaths occurring during the pandemic, I should say, across much of the continent. Uh, is this really a factor of limited testing programs so that we don't have a window into the pandemic? Um, might the virus have come early already? And we, because surveillance systems were not in place, we might have missed the, 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 the arrival of the virus. It might have a low, uh, later attenuated arrival and be causing um, less mortality because of competing causes uh, of death at older ages in particular. 
And also there may be a mitigating effect of the age structure and residential patterns of the population. Some combination of these factors is undoubtedly at work. And the, the, the answer is when we need to think in terms of parsing out mortality by cause, particularly at the community level, it becomes enormously complex. This brings us then to the idea of excess mortality. We think that this complementary measure uh, is really a, a simple and fairly comprehensive way of capturing in a timely manner the full human cost of the pandemic. I want to explain excess mortality just in two parts. The first part of measuring it is to focus on the enumeration of all deaths that are occurring now, regardless of cause, by age, sex, and location to get that information on a weekly basis so that we are tracking today the uh, current levels of mortality. The second piece of measuring excess mortality is to establish a baseline of expected deaths or, has, or historically observed deaths for the same epidemiologic week and the same location sometime in the past, a year ago, or an average of the previous years. The measurement, the gap between today's observed mortality and that that has been expected is in fact what we call the excess mortality. This mortality can be attributed not only to COVID directly, but also to the causes of death that are as a result of the sorts of factors that I outlined a moment ago. And these visualizations of excess mortality are becoming more, uh, more common. Um, these graphs may be somewhat familiar. On the left, we have a graph from Switzerland on the, by age group. On the right, from some states in the United States, uh, published by The Economist. Major outlets, uh, news outlets, are increasingly using excess mortality visualizations such as this or such as these to, uh, to represent the pandemic. Well, that's all well and good, but again, what bringing, uh, bringing us back to our main concern here, what about places on the globe that are not being uh, able to routinely and readily report these data, particularly from the community? At the moment, uh, at least 13 countries, and there are more every day, many with the support of Bloomberg Philanthropies and, and other partners are leveraging existing sources of data or creating new ones to measure excess mortality. Uh, in part, they're relying upon the technical package that we have produced in partnership with the World Health Organization leadership with CDC Foundation and CDC leadership and regional partners in Africa and Asia and Pacific. Um, this uh, technical package is assisting countries along a spectrum of, uh, of, of system readiness, if you will. So I'll show briefly a, a, a graph from Brazil, one of the countries that is producing rapid mortality surveillance. And the point I would like to make here, uh, you'll be hearing much more about Brazil shortly, is that uh, rapid mortality surveillance was actually a kind of innovative use of existing public data. Brazil and uh, other countries such as Colombia and even Peru have the availability of data and have had to make fairly minor uh, um, uh, innovations, I could say, compared to where else we've been working in order to establish the rapid mortality surveillance and the measures of excess mortality that rapid mortality surveillance can produce. Pivoting now a little bit to a discussion of low income countries, what we find is that in, in these settings, uh, systems do lack high coverage and completeness and they lack timeliness. This makes solutions for coming up with ways of measuring incident deaths uh, more complex, slower to implement, and more resource intensive. Um, with the notable exception of South Africa, I think this is generally the case in, in much of Africa and some of Southeast Asia, where governments have a need to measure the mortality both from the community, because there's such a big community mortality burden that exists regardless of the pandemic, and from health facilities in order to form a complete picture. 
In such circumstances, our early experience has shown that uh, the community-based surveillance piece of the uh, um, technical work that needs to be accomplished has been a bit more challenging than getting uh, um, facility-based surveillance up and running. But in that regard, uh, Vital Strategies has been working with a few countries, including Rwanda, Senegal, and Bangladesh, and supporting some others to leverage routine health systems, uh, and sorry, routine health information systems, and boost reporting of deaths to a weekly basis. And this is mostly for those of you who are familiar with health information systems, uh, leveraging functionality within the district health management, uh, the district health information system, DHIS2. Community-based rapid surveillance, in which deaths occurring are actively detected and reported on, uh, we are supporting the government of Colombia and the government of Bangladesh to undertake this work. Uh, in Colombia, the intention is to reach remote and, and uh, harder to access po uh, parts of the population in the country. And in Bangladesh, uh, we're leveraging um, a, a, a expanding model of active uh, vital event notification to be able to identify deaths on a more rapid basis than has previously been the case under the civil registration system there. As we're beginning to support countries to produce these data, uh, of course, the question arises about their use. Uh, in addition to advocacy and serving as a corrective for uh, misinformation, um, excess mortality data can be viewed in conjunction with other core indicators to assess um, geographic uh, disparities, for example, um, or perhaps even to chart the lagging, because mortality is a lagging indicator, but at least the impact of public health and social measures that may uh, ideally have a, 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 an impact on both the number of cases and hence the number of deaths that are observed. If indeed there is available cause of death data, uh, it may be possible to uh, understand the excess mortality more in terms of the specific causes of death that comprise it. Certainly the majority will be COVID and suspected COVID, but the quotient that is left over the additional excess due to other causes may be due to some important system breakdowns in the health system and, and knowing the specific causes can indeed help to pinpoint um, uh, action for addressing those situations. And lastly, uh, and this is more significant than it may seem, uh, and I think that uh, we may have the opportunity to, dis to discuss this further, it can shore up uh, death registration during the pandemic, that is rapid mortality surveillance, can shore up the uh, death registration during the pandemic. And in fact, we are um, working with uh, at least one country <clears throat> intending to, to undertake rapid mortality surveillance for uh, precisely this reason, uh, in addition to getting a handle on the pandemic. So summing up, I just want to point out that we know that knowledge is, uh, is key to the response. That a focus on solely COVID-19 diagnosed cases and deaths is necessary, we have to unpack it, but it's insufficient to understand the true magnitude of the pandemic. And measuring excess mortality is one very familiar and at least relatively straightforward thing to do in order to fill the space of knowing the epidemic in terms of crucial statistics. I would argue that it also adds to the urgency of, of pre-COVID-19 CRVS improvements. Um, uh, these are, I believe, the long-term solution for uh, a resilient system that can indeed meet the needs of uh, future public health emergencies. Um, and uh, the Director of Civil Registration Services in Kenya summed it up nicely, I thought, uh, and these are the words I will leave you with. She said, we've also realized the need for a resilient CRVS system in emergencies such as COVID-19 to meet the needs not only of the population, but of vulnerable and marginalized populations in the country. So 
with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and thank you and um, uh, hand back to uh, Amanda. Thanks so much. Thank you, Philip. Um, I think a uh, great overview to get us kicked off. And now I'd like to turn over to Fatima, who's also with Vital Strategies doing work in Brazil, looking at this excess mortality measurement. Um, and I hope not only will you tell us what happens and what, 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 uh, what the findings are from Brazil and what you've been doing, but also how you've seen it used in policy would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Philip is helping me with the presentation. Okay. Yeah, so we are talking about excess mortality in Brazil. Next, please. Uh, we talk about methods, how we did it. The excess mortality dashboard with the results we did with the CONAIS, which is the a consortium of the health, uh, state, health departments uh, at states. And also an ongoing work about race and skin color excess mortality. Next, please. Here it is the data source. We combined two data sources, okay? Really CRVS work, you know? Uh, we have uh, vital statistics from the Minister of Health team is the mortality information system. Uh, we, did, we took the historical data and civil registry uh, CR from 2000, 2019 and 2020. We use just a natural cause of death. Uh, we apply to correction in CR data because uh, just for, con of course, for places where with the under-registered death in CR, we, we compared the vital statistics in 2019 with CR 2019, and we have the gap by place sex and age group, and we apply a correction using the vital statistics as a reference. You can see here in the right, this figure is from one state, very poor state, and you can see the gap between the blue line and the red line. Blue line is CR, registered in 2020, and the red line is vital statistics in this state. So we, we apply the correction when it was needed, just brought it as an example for us how we did it, but we did for 2020, 2019. Uh, also, we have the expected death in 2020. We estimate using a uh, forecast uh, with exponential smoothing using the vital statistics time series as our goal, as our reference. And uh, all estimates below zero for small areas, we did the average. So mix methods. And uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, excess mortality weeks with values below the projected baseline was disregarded. The, we had levels of analysis, so state, sex, and age, two age groups. And to obtain the total, we did we we used the most disaggregated level, you no know, place, age, and sex, and summed it up to get the total by by state or by country level or region level. Next, please. Uh, so here is for skin color, we, because in Brazil we, we, we have race and skin color because we don't have exactly race. No, we, we, we use this definition that, that's the same usage in census, also using the vital statistics uh, data. So we did a redistribution of missing data among all categories of the race and skin color. But we work with just two categories, white and black plus pardos. Pardos, we translate to brown, no, so the most understanding is a mixed population. And we did all the, the, the estimates by disaggregated level. Okay, next, please. So here is what Philip showed, no, uh, the Brazil uh, dashboard with the, this consortium of the health states departments. Uh, in blue, it's the mortality estimate for 2020 using the forecast model and the historical data, uh, vital statistics historical data. In red, you, we have the excess mortality using mainly the civil register data with the correction applied for under resistor death. But for the average of the country, it's not so big the correction. More than some parts, yes, it is big. But you can see here a uh, rapid increase starting in the middle of March peak areas, end of May and beginning of June. 
and starts to decline, but it is because the epidemic was moving in the country territory. So even the end of the time series, uh, we don't believe it's going so fast, uh, it's going down so, so fast. And we are uh, discussing about the correct for delay registration. Next, please. So here is an example of the archaeology uh, two, uh, phases, different phases you know, in pandemic in Brazil. And in the left, we call it a, a late epidemic, that is, this region, this state stays in a central region, has the border with Bolivia, so very west for us. You know? And you have you see that it started to peak in June. And the peak of excess mortality occurred at the end of July. And this is still going on the epidemic in this state and also in the region. In the right, you see Rio de Janeiro states you know, uh, with early epidemic because it, epidemic starts in big cities in the Southeast region like Rio. So you see the increase rapidly, the mortality surveillance increasing the middle of March, peaking in the beginning of June. And now we see, it cannot so clear here, but in the end of this time series, there is a starting to increase again the excess mortality here because the mortality is speaking again. So uh, we are following these uh, states closely in other states as well. And next, please. So here is the map. No, so in the, in the left, numbers. In the right, percentage. So numbers of excess mortality, what we have, São Paulo state, the most populous state in the country with the higher number, now 18 excess mortality death in the state. And in the right uh, percentage, so you see that 74% of increase in the Amazon state. So Amazon state was really a surprise to start the, the epidemic early, was beginning of the March, you no, know, and pick it quickly. And why? So we are still elaborating. In the most remote area, we had the, the same uh, start as in the southeast regions, in, this, in the urbanized city in the country. So it started in the north and in the southeast. And also you can see that in the south, like in this, our last state called as the South, south Cone, no Rio Grande do Sul, that's the with border with Uruguay and Argentina, is still small increase in the excess mortality because the epidemic is still ongoing in this area. So the, the epidemic moved so from the north, from the southeast to the current countryside. No, and now it's going, it's moving to the south, the Cone, Cone South in Brazil. So we still having these different no, uh, scenarios in the country, and the excess mortality shows very well the scenarios for us. And next, please. Here, who is dying? No, so okay, we have excess mortality, but who is dying? So we can see that more, much more men. So here in blue, men in in red, women. So much more men dying compared to women, like in the average 27% increase compared to women, 18%. But some states, we have 57% 57 increase in the North region. So it's a huge uh, difference among men and women. And also in the age group in the, our uh, right here in the purple, uh, under 60 years old, and in the orange, 60 or more years old. So the impact in, in, in the group that we weren't expecting too much uh, mortality was in the average 28%, but in some uh, regions were higher, no, and also uh, more balanced you know, with the elderly and people under 60. So also we have this pandemic hitting the entire population. Now we we'll see in the next slide, please. So who, who is dying as well is a black people, you no know, black and brown. So I separated just five, four states for presentation, but we are, it's an ongoing work. What you wanna hear? Call attention for the managers that we have vulnerable populations, 
Né? And this kind of analysis could help them to focus more on those populations. So black and brown people had higher percentage of excess mortality than the white sons in all four states we analyzed, also in the average, but we're still, as I said, ongoing work. So uh, it called my our attention. The first state here is Sao Paulo, at the top of the figure. You no, know, Sao Paulo is the most populous state, most richest state in the country, with the uh, sixty percent of population white. But you see the excess mortality in the black and browns among the black and browns was thirty-two percent, compared to eleven percent among the white population. And in the other states, you can see similarities. No more black and brown people dying than whites dying with this excess mortality. And when we move it to the right, that's 30 to 59 years old, we can see that in Sao Paulo state, no, we had 42% in excess mortality among black and brown in this age group, compared to 24% of the white uh, population in this, also this age group. The other states have more balanced distribution, also high in this age group, of course, 30 to 59 years old. But uh, we are discussing with the states that they, how to focus this kind of population, the most more vulnerable population, how can we uh, use the excess mortality to, to give a better a picture of the impact of the pandemic. And next, please. So the excess mortality uh, dashboard that we did with the con eyes and, and stakeholders by states, no? so it's very, uh, has been used for decision makers, technical personnel, civil society, media, and others. Also researchers have been discussed with us how to uh, use this to estimate COVID, also prevalence of uh, virus circulation, so on. So I, I should put some, some news on the media and uh, national newspapers showing uh, they, are, they have been following the update. We update every week the excess mortality dashboard. So media has been following and has been using this information as well. And next, please. So also we, uh, the dashboard is a trustable source of data. So also agencies specializing in fighting fake news have been using the excess mortality data. So for, for instance, when Brazil reached the 100,000 deaths by COVID, there were a massive attack of fake news saying that this 100,000 deaths, in fact, uh, wasn't, uh, weren't caused by COVID. It was caused by other causes that people would die anyway. So they died by COVID, but they would die anyway. So, so this kind of agencies, they started to use the excess mortality to show, no, look at the excess mortality. So people are dying, not just because they, they are dying, but the, the disease that they could die, but they are dying. Uh, there is an excess mortality that is exactly a higher or sometimes it's the same of the number of COVID deaths. So we estimate that in Brazil, it's very close to the number. So excess mortality is due to COVID in around 80% now, but we are still uh, working on this estimate because of the delay of registration. So very trustable source you have been using a lot and the media is uh, around the, us to asking for more analysis. Also with the, we have been working with the state health departments and please Philip, the next one. Uh, so here it is the dashboard with CONAS, the excess mortality that I showed for you so, so much, of course. No, and the new dashboard we did with the Minister of Health. Now we're using vital statistics and comparing vital statistics with civil resistance by state using estimated excess mortality as well. So, but this is a new one. We have just launched this with the ministry. And uh, here is not so updated. No, because uh, there is a delay that's higher for vital statistics compared to CR, 
but CR has a, a lower uh, completeness. So that's why we mix the sources of data. And here we need, we, we realized that really needed to correct for the delayed registration. Because when the pandemic moved from big cities to countryside, small cities, rural areas, the delay in registration in the CR is bigger compared to urbanized cities. So uh, now it's important to correct for the delay of registration and we are discussing about it with the vital strategy group, the anal analytic group, how to do this correction. But uh, by now it will be very useful if we use the, uh, this kind of a correction. So that's what I have to show you. I would like to thank you for this invitation, the opportunity to show the excess mortality in Brazil. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Marinho. That was uh, really interesting in particular. It's just completely obvious um, the implications of this data for health system response, for geographical focus, for reaching vulnerable groups. Um, the implications are, are very clear. So th thank you so much for that presentation. Let's now turn to Aaron Nichols. Uh, you obviously have been working on this from a global perspective, but you're also sitting in the US Centers for Disease Control. What, you know, what's your view on sort of the state of the systems at this stage and what, what else do we need to do better on? Sure, good day everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Nichols. I lead a small team focused on global civil registration and vital statistics improvement situated at, at uh, CDC in their National Center for Health Statistics. Since 2015, we've partnered with Vital Strategies and WHO through the Bloomberg Data for Health Initiative to support one of a growing number of initiatives that in the last 10 to 15 years have focused on improving civil registration and vital statistics or CRVS in low and middle income countries. Philip well laid out the forces that are behind the challenges that we're trying to tackle through that initiative. So now parallel to this ongoing momentum for CRVS improvement, there's this critical demand for timely mortality data. Surveillance colleagues throughout CDC are looking at what data is available across a multitude of existing surveillance platforms and thinking about how these platforms can be leveraged to compile mortality information. A unique openness to system integration and convergence of data collection efforts among the surveillance community may lead us to lasting change in the CRVS space. If I can be a bit academic for a minute, civil registration is the continuous, permanent, compulsory, and universal recording of the occurrence and characteristics of vital events. So in this case, we focus on death or mortality. Civil registration is the ideal source of mortality information because of these inherent characteristics of the system. Unlike surveys, which are one-off or intermittent and only include a sample of the population, civil registration is continuous, permanent, and universal. Because it's compulsory by law, it provides a solid basis for everyone to participate in the system. Well, the health sector has always recognized the value of mortality data and therefore has been one of its most regular users. Engagement with other sectors, including registration officials, that are typically in ministries of home affairs is required to achieve a comprehensive mortality surveillance program that is linked with civil registration. This engagement often requires more time, attention and coordination than vertical disease surveillance systems have traditionally been able to give. And so we now hope to leverage the parallel interests in CRVS improvement and mortality surveillance. I'll share a little more background about the work of our team and how we've pivoted with the arrival of COVID-19 and what we're thinking about as we look ahead in this space. As a partner of the Data for Health Initiative, our team has been supporting the rapid mortality surveillance guidance that Philip just described uh, in its development, dissemination and implementation. We're helping to coordinate multiple partners to support a comprehensive mortality surveillance program with rapid mortality surveillance components in both Uganda and Zambia. Additionally, we coordinate a community of practice focused on medical legal death investigation, which has been used to share COVID-19 death certification guidelines among a global forum of medical examiners. 
to help identify a probable cause of death where there's no physician to certify it. Our team also works with WHO, uh, the Verbal Autopsy Reference Group. Um, and for COVID-19, we've compiled guidance on the use of verbal autopsy in the context of COVID-19. And we're now coordinating an evaluation to assess whether the new questions can identify probable COVID-19 deaths. And finally, supporting US CDC's international COVID response, our team is working to integrate mortality surveillance across various existing surveillance platforms in response to the increased demand for information on mortality. Um, so I have just two slides to show here real quick. Um, Michael, can you help show those please? There we go. Um, we developed this slide to show the various potential sources of mortality information across platforms. CDC supported activities among these include the Child Health and Mortality Prevention Surveillance Initiative or CHAMPS, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and mortality surveillance work through US government PEPFAR support. With the many possible sources of information, there are many opportunities but bringing these together in an efficient and useful manner requires extensive coordination and support that our team is working to provide. Next slide, please. So in the second slide, we see a stark contrast among countries on the completeness or lack of information on cause of death that is officially compiled. The countries uh, in gray on this slide have no data available. This depicts the information paradox where in the places we need information the most as supporting partners, it's not available. But as was showing, shown in the first slide, we do have many potential sources and we have an opportunity now to bring them together for optimal use. So looking forward, uh, we're working on an implementation package for comprehensive mortality surveillance programs, one that, for example, may be hosted by a National Public Health Institute. And together with our colleagues in global health programs across CDC, we're supporting efforts to coordinate, deduplicate, and integrate health information systems, such as DHIS2, to clarify roles and responsibilities across agencies and to facilitate efficient and secure data sharing across all stakeholders that need this mortality information. And for these efforts, our regional partners, including WHO, Africa CDC's Mortality Surveillance Program, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, and the UN Economic and Statistical Commission for Asia and the Pacific, play a critical and complementary role in advocating at the highest levels of government and in providing important coordination among the relevant government agencies. So in short, this pandemic has underscored the need for harmonized and timely mortality surveillance systems. Uh, and we aim to build a home for rapid mortality surveillance efforts within a comprehensive program that is backed by the continuous compulsory and universal structure that is inherent to civil registration and vital statistics and that ultimately supports the human right to be counted. So that's all for me. Uh, it's great to be part of this forum and looking forward to the discussions. Thank you, Erin, and uh, thank you also for sharing the slide that uh, shows, you know, there's a lot that's been done um, but as you can see, it's directed to specific populations or to specific diseases and um, to get, you know, together we have to kind of, I think I liked your word optimize. Um, I might come back to you to reflect on um, how easy that is or not and what kinds of things you think might make it easier. Um, but now, now let's go to Dr. Samira Asma, who's at the World Health Organization um, to reflect a little on this issue from her perspective and um, some new ideas in terms of building uh, rapid mortality surveillance as we go forward. Go ahead, uh, Samira. Thank you for joining. Thank us. you, Amanda. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello to all the panelists, uh, colleagues, and everyone, uh, all the listeners. Uh, thank you for having me as well as for WHO to uh, have a discussion on this very important and timely topic. Data matters. Timely, reliable, actionable data is very, very important. I will make a few points here. 
uh, 12 of the 17 SDGs and 67 out of 20, 234 indicators of SDGs rely on good or well-functioning civil registration and vital statistics. Uh, it is the bedrock of public health. Today, we are reporting 973,000 deaths due to COVID. We know uh, this is the number that is reported. We also had earlier discussions uh, that this may be an underreport because the deaths uh, reporting is often lagging. But there are also other reasons of underreporting. What I'm told is 73% of births are registered and only 50% of deaths are registered. And um, only half of the 194 member states report on only 80% of 80% uh, of deaths for 15 years and older. And only one third of the countries report accurately on the causes of death. So what we are seeing today in the midst of the pandemic is a reflection of a long standing problem. And that's what are the solutions that the partners Vital Strategy, CDC, and many experts around, uh, around the world have come together and est established a mechanism of rapid mortality surveillance. The other area is how do countries report certified deaths? We are getting the reports from countries through the surveillance mechanisms from the facilities. And as Philippe mentioned, that there are deaths that are occurring out of facilities in the communities, and that is where I, the problem is. We have the tools, the capacity building is going to take time, but also I think the commitment from partner organizations. Here I mean all the UN entities in the countries, different ministries, ministries of health, ministries of justice, ministry of interior, there is often a disconnect because the responsibility of death certification and causes of death lies with different ministries. So that is also an inherent problem that we are facing. And I think coordination amongst all partners, data for initiative uh, led by Bloomberg Philanthropies and bringing in five partner organizations, including WHO is an impressive effort that has to be scaled at speed. SDG 17 recognizes that we as a global community ought to invest in countries that are least developed and small island developing states, as well as other countries that are facing the problems. And it is apparent, counting the deaths, which is a fact, we are having problems. Also not to forget that behind every death that is being reported, there is a person behind. Um, often we forget that. So I just thought we should take a moment to recognize the lives that we are losing. Um, and more importantly, not being able to account for, uh, for those and improve our response uh, in a way that would have an impact because we are, as you rightly said, uh, Amanda, uh, flying uh, with our eyes closed or being um, blinded or shooting in the dark. Solutions and the work that is underway as already mentioned by uh, Erin, uh, Fatma and Philippe. What we have done rapidly is introduced a portal directly to work with the member states to report on certified debts on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, by age, by at least broad causes. And uh, Dr. Tedros, who often and frequently says, we cannot, uh, we cannot um, 
make progress, sorry. We cannot make progress if we cannot measure progress. It's a simple concept. Um, so this portal has been established and we are working with countries to support the countries to report in, in a rapid manner so that we can gather the certified deaths. It is work in progress. We have got a very positive response from a number of countries, and we are hoping in the next month or so, we should have a majority of countries reporting and this process will continue. The second point is that WHO hosts a global mortality database. It is a unique database approved by member states and the deaths date back to 1950s. And it's reported all cause by age and by sex. It's a unique database. And what we have done is scaled it up and will be launching the revised um, and enhanced uh, database for, for the public uh, in, the, in a couple of months. Third, given the challenges that you have heard, WHO has also prioritized CRVS as a flagship initiative within the division of data analytics and delivery for impact. The whole data architecture to drive delivery and make WHO a modern data-driven organization is a flagship of Dr. Ted Rose's transformation initiative of WHO. WHO has not been transformed since its inception, and now it has gone through a massive re-engineering so that we are responsive, embracing partnerships, and be, uh, being able to support country, uh, countries in a coordinated way way, bringing the partnerships, tools, uh, and technical assistance together. So in this regard, a month ago, WHO, along with partners, we launched the Score for Health technical package for data. And these have curated 90 tools and essential interventions. And each of the letter stands for surveying or surveillance of population and their risks civil registration and vital statistics, optimizing routine health information systems, reporting uh, data in a transparent way, and calling for investments into data systems. And finally, actionable data, enabling use of data to drive policies and programs and improve those, and ultimately have a measurable impact in the lives of the people we are, we are serving. So this is an essential package that has been launched. Going forward, each of the countries have done a self-assessment of where they stand for each of these elements. This will be launched in November, and then we know where each of the country systems are so that we can make targeted interventions and support in areas that the countries are requesting the support. Coming back to COVID again, we have also established a secretariat jointly between WHO and UN Division of Statistics, UN DESA under ECOSOC, to start quantifying the direct and indirect impact of COVID-19. And that work is going to be challenged if we don't have all the deaths quantified. And that is where the rapid mortality surveillance comes into place, into, um, is an important uh, area of work. How do we make it happen? We can say it is only one country here, two countries there, five countries here. We don't have time. Just we are away nine and a half years to 2030. And so many of the indicators are relying on good causes of death and death information. So the question here is, are we going to repair and fill the gap, fix the problem and take another nine years? Or we rapidly in an sense, with a sense of urgency, given that we have tools now, we know which partners are influential in making this happen. We know what it will cost. So I 
think that is the question and that is the message I would like us to uh, take away. And WHO, along with many partners that have been mentioned with UN agencies and bilateral as well as national governments, planning to have a meeting in March at the UN uh, Statistical Commission to again make a renewed call to action with some concrete actions so that we can once for all address these data gaps by end of 2021. It's very ambitious, but we must be able to come back next year and say X number of countries with good causes of death have, uh, have been reported, but also that there is a sustained capacity that is left in countries. Our countries have centers of excellence that have been established in the countries. It is possible. We speak of Brazil, we speak of Peru, some uh, provinces in Bangladesh, but we need to see this scaled up rapidly and uh, quickly, um, as soon as possible. So with that, I think we are open at WHO to work with everyone and I look forward to coming together and making a leap forward so that we address this problem and find a solution, which we already have. It's a matter of getting to work and making a measurable a difference. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Samira, for joining us. And yeah, I mean, this is one of those areas where, um, you know, we do kind of know what to do. Of course, we should test, you know, the relative cost effectiveness of various things, but we're, we're sort of facing, we're faced with um, uh, an opportunity. And, and I hope to see, I think, you know, can we invest as much in this core data that is important to get out of COVID plus, 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 um, as yeah. we do in other areas. And this is where the global health community can really add value in a way where, you know, we, we have something to offer, uh, not just money, but know-how and country experiences and exchange and things like that. Let me um, ask you a follow-up question, each of you on the issue of, um, innovation in the context of these continuous permanent and universal systems that Aaron uh, spoke with us. Uh, we have heard about, this is a new an, an analytical approach, excess mortality as a way of using existing data better to depict what is happening when we have le, uh, problems with classification of deaths because it's a novel disease um, and, and because of general weaknesses in the system uh, in health facilities to classify deaths. Um, can you, uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, uh, Philip, and um, we'll just go backwards through the group, but if you can sort of reflect on what kinds of innovations you've seen. Of course, you know, the standard person in the private sector looks at, uh, at us in the field and says, you know, why are we still doing death reporting with paper? Um, why is it so slow? Why can't we know in real time? You'd think that it would be easy enough to collect this information directly from the population. Um, some, in some cases, you know, the health system is slower reporting deaths than the civil registrations. In the other cases, it's the opposite, as we saw in Brazil, um, if I understood your presentation correctly, Fatima. But what kinds of, are there fixes out there that you've seen work that are promising? We'll start with you, Philip. Sure. Well, I think there are systemic innovations and technological innovations uh, as an easy way of, bracket, of bucketing things to begin with. I'm sure you could segment them further, but for the sake of our, our brief discussion here, let's think about technological innovations are precisely the ones that you identified. So moving toward systems, particularly in cause of death, that leverage the wide use of systems like the DHIS2 system, but automate data entry and generate uh, automated cause of death assignment through the application of, uh, in, uh, there's an automated cause of death assignment tool called IRIS, and that introduces much more systematicity, consistency, and so forth into the coding of causes of death. So automation throughout the cause of death uh, attribution system. And then in terms of system connections, uh, and I'm limiting my remarks just to death registration and cause of death. Um, in terms of death registration, making sure that the health sector civil registration link is functional, that systems are interoperable 
and that events that occur within the health sector are notified to the civil registration authorities for later follow-up for registration. In the context of COVID, and I'll wrap up here, um, I'm, and I'm sure there are other innovations that my colleagues will identify, but one that jumps out to me is the innovation of taking a surveillance viewpoint and a surveillance model that you have in something like programs of integrated disease surveillance and response, which are very widespread surveillance platform in Africa, adding in there a way of detecting all incident deaths creates an on-ramp to the CRVS system for detecting community deaths in a way that we badly need to get a handle on the community burden of mortality because as we've been saying, so many deaths occurred there. So I'll just uh, throw those few thoughts out. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fatima. The proposal of Philippe is exactly what we did in Brazil to improve the completeness and the quality of cause of death. So work with close with surveillance because they are they have their own data also they capture that. So validate the cause of death with them, help to spread. Also working at the community level. Important. Usually people don't register death because they don't have any reason. It's a different birth and death, no? So that's yeah, exactly why. No? They, don't, they don't inherit anything, don't have life insurance, don't have pension. So uh, is usually living in remote areas and very poor. If they take too much, too long time to register death, they have to pay a fee because they have a exemption, but, but a short time. So how to work with this situation? Now, how to make it much more a, a kind of a, a civil rights and the families to know the reasons of the death? No, what, what is the cause of death? People wanna know much more than register, they wanna know why. No, why my, my beloved diet? What is the cause? So if you could work with communities, move in the community, around this kind of goal in interest, common interest, they, they will come. They will do it, this work with you, also help you with the uh, reporting, you no know, reporting death. So when we establish kind of surveillance in uh, non-official cemeteries, it's not illegal because everyone knows where it is. So it's not illegal, no, it's non official. But uh, communities, they can, they can help in this kind of uh, surveillance. And I, I agree with Samira, it's possible. It's possible, change it, and we can do it uh, rapidly. If you cannot do it in 21st century, please. No, we are talking about, uh, uh, we have, as Philip said, uh, lots of uh, uh, technology available. Now we have experience and knowledge as well. Now we have a, a, a partners, international partners, interest from countries. So it's possible to move it and move it quickly. Uh, I believe in it. I really believe it's possible. If you agree all in a plan né, with the countries, a kind of agreement, and we go on with all efforts that we could move it, you know, uh, a group of uh, good technical people interested, you know, so we could do it. Yeah, th th thank you for your words and also for reminding us exactly of the point. What is the incentive that any individual has to report that a death has occurred um, if you're not working in a health facility or otherwise? And that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Uh, and there are simple things that can be done to involve people and to uh, make that information relevant for them um, and their lives. So, so thanks for those comments. Um, Aaron, did you wanna reflect a little on this question of the systemic and uh, technological innovations that Philip uh, sure. put out for us? Yeah, I think Philip and, and Fatima very well laid out um, points that I very much agree with. But to add to that, I think um, COVID's really forced us to see and test the limits of what we can do with support via uh, virtual platforms. And I think we've we've really seen um, the the benefits that those can bring when we're trying to to bring this this 
new technical product, um, technical area, and, and supporting new cadres of, of work, the workforce in, in uh, participating in it. Um, I mentioned earlier the community of practice uh, that our team has supported in the medical legal death investigation. So those are medical examiners um, that are responsible for doing uh, autopsies and, and death investigations. Often it varies by country, but often all deaths that take place out of health facilities, um, maybe just suspicious deaths, but often there's only one or a small handful in a country working very much in isolation. And that's very much a field that, that is best benefited by being collaborative in nature. So using virtual platforms to give these, these folks a chance to iterate and review uh, difficult cases. Um, you've all read in the, the mainstream news, the challenges that we have in certifying COVID deaths. So that's really been, I think, a great um, contribution to, to improving um, this cause of death information around the world. Uh, in general and, and in relation to COVID specifically. Um, another example, Philip mentioned the IRIS automated system. Um, coding's very challenging. You, you can do it in provisional ways for surveillance purposes, but um, in complete and, and full practice and, and for official statistics, it, it can be quite complicated and, and um, there are often deaths that have to be reviewed manually. And again, you get back to needing special expertise and experience. So um, we've been able to facilitate uh, bi-monthly bi uh, remote set uh, online sessions for, for coders in India. Um, so focusing on advanced cases. So we can link them with, with experts that have extensive experience and they can continue to develop uh, their knowledge on this. So I think that's some, an area that, that we found to be very helpful. Excellent. Samira, what, what are your thoughts? We have talked about mobile phone surveys as another, uh, lots of researchers are in the business of mobile phone surveys and, uh, you know, how useful are they for mortality measurement and for extending, you know, in real life sur sample based surveys? You're on mute. <laughs> I think you're still on mute. It's it's always a Zoom event when one of us is on mute. <laughs> can can you adjust that, Samira? Can you hear me now? Yes, Great, perfect. Thank you. I'll make three points: people, technology, partnerships. With regard to people, I think there is no replacement with any technology. We have to invest in building the capacity providing the incentives, there is an attraction to this topic that is left behind uh, the CRVS, the field of CRVS. The training in good medical uh, causes of deaths uh, certification in the medical schools, uh, short courses, et cetera, it has been done, but not at a scale, at a global scale. So investing in people, extremely important. And I think now, we don't need to travel, uh, take flights and, and be in a hotel room and do the workshops. This can be uh, training anytime, anywhere uh, with mentorship, with mentorship from people who have done it um, and, and incentives to the mentors as well. So a virtual community that is really prioritized and investing and infusing. Second is we have seen now as a result this year, as a result of COVID, a lot of innovations, a lot of apps, a lot of tools, a lot of private partner sector partners who have come up with good solutions. So we have the tools and the technology. Iris was mentioned, DHIS2 was mentioned. We have the digital ICD-11 that we launched the updates to uh, just a few days ago here. Mobile phone surveys is a very important cost efficient way of gathering information. Uh, we are launching the World Health uh, Data Collection Platform, multi mode, multi topic, multi platform data collection with technical support in consultation with all the partners. 
mobile phones i think is a, a is a very uh, easy and affordable, efficient way uh, to gather information. GI, geospatial technology is another very important resource, especially burial sites, health facilities, etc. cetera. Uh, analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, but when we have the data in one place, uh, that is important. Th those things can be automated. Uh, uh, how to uh, uh, analyze, how to forecast, etc. So we have the technology and the tools at our disposal. I just sometimes wonder why can't they be an amber alert when there is a death that takes place in a community? There are lessons already from community health workers in other areas. Uh, we should innovate and use those experiences for this purpose. And finally, we can do it alone. We can be uh, fragmented. Partnerships, public-private partnerships, private uh, partnerships at all levels here. But I think, again, with a common approach, standards is going to be extremely important so that we don't keep reinventing the wheel um, and, and go in different areas or um, not making the impact that this area demands. So my last point is the combination of people, innovation, technology, tools, and partnerships. Hopefully we can solve the puzzle. Agreed. Well, let me just ask, we have the audience is also welcome to writing questions on Twitter um, with the hashtag CGD talks or at CGDev. Um, or yeah, I think those are the ways. So if you want to submit questions, we can address them. I have a question to you about uh, all this, of course, makes sense. And of course, the CRVS community has asked for this before from the community of funders. Um, but you know, there's a lot of these ongoing activities. There's a lot of um, earmarked money for specific diseases that is hard to deploy for systems uses. Can you reflect a little bit on the sort of uh, the obstacles that you see to getting to better coordination and sort of what we might be able to do about it? Of course, we all want it to work out, but we all know also that in the real world, it's hard to get everyone to move in the same direction. Um, do you have any reflections on that? Uh, maybe starting with Philip. Yeah, well, off the top of my head, I, I, I would tend to stand back and view these things from a pretty distanced perspective. And what I see is a couple of things. One, I do see progress. Mm -hmm. I do see uh, a, 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 a sea change in the kind of support for CRVS strengthening now compared to 10 years ago or more when we first published the call for addressing the scandal of invisibility as we named it at the time. So there certainly is progress. I think um, what we find is that we're able to make progress on the back though of uh, or hitched to another wagon. So even the global financing facility really falls under the rubric of maternal and child health. Um, and there, there are precious few, such as the Bloomberg Philanthropies investments that are straight up for CRVS and cause of death data strengthening um, and for using those data to have impact more importantly, or at least as importantly. Um, I would say then there are two uh, or three strategic alliances that we in the CRVS need to, community need to make. One is to the enormous um, enterprise of identity management systems that are beginning to proliferate throughout the world. Um, the relationship of establishing legal identity to identity management and CRBS has been the subject of the UN of a high, uh, high level panel at the United Nations. And they've pointed out, uh, in fact, the CRBS is the foundational system for the establishment of legal identity. And that is a feed into the ID system a death of an individual who's in that ID system needs to retire a record mm -hmm. at a certain moment. So there should be a symbiotic relationship with the ID community. Mm -hmm. The other big driver is governance. Um, one of the drivers of CRVS improvement, I think, from the EU has been the idea that we can avoid the great gross expense of creating registration, voter registration roles 
if we had proper civil registration and identity management systems in place, rather than recreating these once every election cycle. Uh, and I, I have seen certainly investment come from that space. Um, so I think between that, um, ID systems, governance community, also very much a women's rights gender issue. So allies in that space, I think, are a natural source of alliance for and partnership, as I think uh, Samira very nicely pointed out. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. And, and for measures of equality in general, right? I think Fatima's uh, presentation really shows how important yeah, this state is for a vulnerable community and inequality. Uh, Fatima, do you have any uh, thoughts on, you know, Brazil has made an enormous amount of progress on this. What were the ingredients? Where did the leadership come from? Um, what would you say has worked well and less well? So it's uh, in the thinking a country pers perspective, okay? Uh, how we we started it is this uh, prioritize because usually people prioritize the disease you no know? surveillance disease surveillance any demands many demands from others so much much, much more important is surveillance and the crvs has been the poor cousin you no know? in this international community also in national communities as well so no one is interested in this. So how to how to improve some you know, the, this kind of uh, data uh, in a country with the uh, territory uh, where we have rural areas, which uh, we have exactly lower completeness. So how to move the not just the public policy, but starting to move all the interests from the communities, because as I said. Maybe for them it's not so important to register the death, but it is important to them know, to know the cause of death. They want to know. Families want to know. It's a, that their interest. So move with this interest with them because they will help the public policy. So they would be much more interested in, in, in working with, you know, communicating if they have any death in the, the community also uh, monitoring non-official cemeteries. So create an alliance with the people. Now we are technicians, you know, even some uh, coordinator directors, who I was in direct minister of health. But if you don't move with our own people, you no know, create a, a network you no know, until the most remote area that will not improve it. You no, know, will work with estimates, of course, okay, it's okay. But if we can move it, but we have to create this alliance and a network with not just people with the uh, positions in the governments, but also people with the interest in the community level, the families, they wanna move it. Believe yeah. me, they wanna do, they wanna do it. It's our main allies in this process. If you yeah. create this, we can move it. Don't be afraid of the people, no? Uh, never be afraid of <laughs> them, no? But uh, create this kind of um, fusion of a horizon. So how can we uh, get uh, some fusion of our ideas, no? Of what we think about what is resisting our death, no? In the cause of death. Now, what is important for us from, uh, a government perspective, what is important for their own community to know. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a process that we can create, but it works and it creates the foundation for a sustainable process. Yeah, okay. I think that's a, a really vital and important point. And it's especially true, you know, mo many countries are federal countries where, you know, and this is the classic local function, right? To register a death. I mean, where else are you going to do it? <laughs> So um, making that all work together, creating yeah. networks of people engaged in similar yeah. activities and consulting yeah. with communities. What would appeal? How, how could we really um, yeah. also be more Also, we effective? blame the people, no? Because they don't resist us. So we blame them, yeah. the poor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we blame the poor, look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they don't, uh, that's it. How can we move this together? We, mm -hmm. we cannot have a solution isolated here. Just Absolutely. And it's, it's not just a technical solution, I think, as both of you have pointed out. Um, 
uh, Aaron, do you have any thoughts on this as you, I love your slide. I'm going to come back to it again and again. <laughs> That's a lot of different initiatives though. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? I mean, yes, interoperability, but um, I mean, like if you had to, I'm not going to ask you this. I'm going to ask someone else, but like, just to say, if we had to, in a next or new administration in the U.S. government, you know, what should we hope for in terms of uh, support to these kinds of functions across the global health portfolio? Don't answer that, Aaron. We'll come to uh, Philip and Fatima maybe instead. But uh, just uh, what do you think might work, uh, Aaron? I'm, there's space and need for, for a lot of innovative technological, you know, more advanced contributions. But I'm going to say something that is, is equally as simple as it is challenging. And that's just maintaining the attention span on this space for a minute, <laughs> figuratively speaking. Um, it, it's, it's keeping with, with the urgency of public health data and, and, and the, the needs that come with that when there's a crisis. Um, CRVS really offers the sustainability just as, as Fatima mentioned there um, for for the investments, for those investments. But given all the challenges everybody's laid out today, the need for coordination, the interministerial nature, the different um, needs that people have when they're looking at mortality data, um, somebody has to keep the focus on that bigger system change and, and providing the situational awareness of where advancements are being made, where funding is available for this or that aspect, um, you know, making sure efforts are complementary. But, you know, even if it's a matter of you get on the, uh, the phone and, and people have a lot of great ideas and then people get busy and we all have a gazillion meetings right now and there's no follow up. So even just keeping that conversation going, taking notes to remember, you know, what everybody committed to and, and holding people accountable to the great ideas that that we can talk about, you know, on a phone call, but then get lost and just keeping that momentum going. Um, so I think it's it's really valuable um, what Philip mentioned with having the Data for Health initiative, where we have this almost luxury to, to fully focus on the civil registration and vital statistics component of it. And I'll note um, when CDC first became engaged with Bloomberg Philanthropies on it, it, it was my, my former supervisor who hired me into this work. Um, Sam Natson, he's been around for over 40 years. He saw the, the improvements in the space with, that they were working on before surveys came around. And they called him up and said, hey, you know, we're interested in investing in this. What do you think? And, you know, most people would be thrilled, you know, talking about this, this area of investment. And his first response was, how much time do you have? You know, it's not something that happens immediately. So I think just working to, to keep the attention, to keep showing the benefit and, and demonstrating the value is an area that's helpful to for committing to. Samira, do you have any reflections on that? And then I'll come back to Philip on the US government question. No. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh huh. Great. Sorry about the technical glitch. Concrete actions now is important. Commitment, commitment at the highest levels of the international uh, UN agencies now, and also the highest levels in the countries, heads of state, ministries of health, ministries in, of justice, and ministries of interior, a real collaboration and a commitment by X month or X time, we will have X percent of deaths and causes of death recorded and reported. This is a matter of, as everyone said, meeting SDGs, human rights, and many other areas. Commitment, the focus should be in the countries of all the multilateral organizations. We need champions champions as communities, champions as people, champions as countries. We need to have cash that can also do the startup funding in the country so that there are people who can be recruited and trained and made into champions. We have budgeted $100 million 
for improving CRVS in most of the countries that lack the information that is needed with all the money going into the countries with standard tools that we already discussed that should be available. So I think an investment by multilaterals and development partners, a hundred million dollars over the course of next two years should close the gap. Coming back, commitment continues. Concrete action is monitored with accountability. We will have countries that have better uh, CRVS information and we have champions. So we have a pipeline of a cadre of, of leaders who are going to carry this forward and hopefully the technology will catch up uh, in countries where we are making progress and not yet there, but there are some very superstar examples that we can take from and replicate and scale up. So bottom line, $100 million, if we can fix, if we can get, we can fix. Okay, but just to be clear, do you have $100 million in the bank for this purpose right now, or? No, uh, we have a proposal <laughs> okay. and we are working with uh, with the partners to bring in coherence and leverage uh, uh, partnerships and uh, bringing in the various partner organizations now at this stage, given the COVID uh, respond and recovery, because we cannot build back better if we leave this gaping gap <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in this area. We already said at the start, 12 of the 17 SDGs re, uh, rely on good uh, co co uh, civil registration and vital statistics. So it's just not the responsibility of the health sector alone or the SDG three. It is again, coming together. So that is the proposal that we are working towards and will be um, hoping that we come together. This is in response to the needs that countries have. Okay. So yeah. being bold and, and hoping that we fulfill uh, yeah. I mean, if not now, when? Um, yeah. I think, uh, so, Philip, I mean, speaking of funding gaps and who's doing what and all of that, as we think about uh, next or new administration in the U.S. government, um, what would you hope to see in terms of the level of effort financially, in terms of organizational changes you might recommend? What do you think is important? I mean, I, the other observation is that, of course, there's a huge uh, emphasis on preparedness now and global health security, and that's appropriate. But this this is also the bedrock of that, um, and has also been an underappreciated element of preparedness, in my view. So, uh, if you had a magic wand, what what would you hope to see? Well, that's exactly where I would start, where you just indicated. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I do believe that civil registration and vital statistics are indeed the bedrock of global uh, health security. And what I would like to see is um, uh, really more of on the US government side, the kind of inter uh, one, one government approach that has characterized responses to things like malaria and HIV AIDS. Um, you know, a PEPFAR for CRVS where we're talking to those who are coming at this from a rights perspective, protecting women and, and others from trafficking. Uh, from underage marriage, from child labor exploitation, those who are, of course, interested on the health side, but also those um, <clears throat> social services that countries are striving to connect to uh, the registration of vital events and to the legal identities and legal legally established persons who are thereby accessed or available um, have availability to access those social services. So education, um, I mentioned the elections commission and governance issues before. Um, I think all of these um, <clears throat> US government entities that are concerned with those aspects of international affairs and that those aspects of global development have a definite stake in the strengthening of CRVS systems. And I would love to see that kind of um, multi-layered lift. Uh, and I think, not only does it speak to what a, a kind of total social fact CRVS is, how it does hit on everything from the most fundamental of human rights through to the most important of uh, vital statistics used to understand and plan and track impact of, of, of important health programs, uh, and have that acknowledgement be reflected in various sources of support uh, I think may ultimately be an easier lift than trying to continue to 
use, say, the health sector as the sharp end of the stick to try and motivate others. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. So I think we've reached the end of our session, but I do want to point out some colleagues of mine, Alan Gelb and Anit Mukherjee, have been working on ID systems for a long time and have looked at their use to make social services more efficient, have looked at it from a gender equality standpoint, um, that it would be great now if we can look at it from the perspective of generating more regular mortality statistics and, and, and creating those crosswalks that we're all talking about. So uh, for me, the agenda is clear. I hope that we can continue to shine a light on this area and, and seize the moment that we have. And I really thank all of you for participating in, in the conversation. It's been great. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, and thanks to all of you online for joining the, the session. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Good.